Hi guys, welcome back to the channel. So today I've got a very special guest on. Uh, I have my good friend, John. Now, uh, John's going to tell you about himself, but I know him personally um, as a work colleague. And so, yeah, we might just get straight and in, in, uh, get straight into it. John, uh, tell us uh, who you are and uh, what it is that you do. And um, how did you come across the, I guess, the keto carnivore space in this way of eating? Sure. Well, thanks, Jeff, for having me on the channel and giving me an opportunity to tell my story. I'm John. I'm uh, obviously an Englishman uh, living in Australia now. I work in uh, rehab as a clinical nurse. And uh, yeah, how I um, got into low carb keto. Um, it's a great title. Um, you know, uh, what the nurses really know about nutrition. We have no formal training. So why are we here talking about it? So I guess um, I'm trained as a motor mechanic, engineer, and clinical nurse. So um, I think why we are talking about this is it's an important topic. And I think we're not sharing any research or work that we've done, but we're sharing what we've sort of learned from, um, you know, other influencers, some fairly high profile, high qualified people. So I guess the... Um, before I became carnivore, I was low carb for about seven years. So being carnivore for about a year now. Um, the biggest influence for me, I think, initially was I watched a YouTube video by a fellow called, um, I think he's a professor of neuroendocrinology, a fellow called Robert Lustig. Mm -hmm. uh, he has a video called Sugar, the Bitter Truth. Uh, I think when I last checked, it had 24 million views, which uh, may not be that impressive because some of the short videos are, uh, you know, into the millions. But this guy did a video that was an hour and 40 and 24 million people, uh, you know, waded through it. So um, Lustig, um, oh, before we get into that, uh, I guess, you know, I was brought up to tweet a balanced diet, eat, eat your fruits and veggies and, you know, you'll grow up mm. to be strong. And if you don't, you won't. Uh, then you get to your teenage years, I guess, and uh, you get a bit of money coming in and, and then you ditch all that for junk food and beer. And as you get into your mid twenties, you, you start to see the old uh, midriff uh, piling up a little bit. And, yeah. you know, uh, getting rid of that is a problem. It, it, it seems to be an ongoing, getting bigger problem rather than anything else. So I guess the essence of this video, um, I can see you're grinning. You, you, you found the same uh, the same thing as me, did you? <laughs> Basically, yeah, definitely. Yeah, it sounds yeah. uh, very similar parallels there. <laughs> yeah. So I guess um, the, the what this video focused on was the change in our food environment and the politics surrounding that. Um, Lustig was talking chiefly on sugar and added sugar to the diet. Um, and, um, you know, he talked about how we'd changed our food environment. We, we've reduced um, animal products and saturated fats because they're harmful and cause heart disease. And not that they do, but, you know, that's, mm. that's been the argument. Um, and that um, sugar um, is not good for you. So, I guess this is a neuroendocrinologist going against the dietary guidelines, which sort of pricked my uh, interest. And I thought, you know, uh, he, he's talking about an area which he's very qualified in. And uh, he particularly talks about the dangers of fructose, which is about 50% of white table sugar, the other half being glucose. Um, so, yeah, that, that was... Um, that's sort of my interest in um, low carb diets. Robert Lustig also talked about the three major hormones uh, that control metabolism and hunger and satiety, those being uh, ghrelin, leptin, and insulin. Um, the sole reasons that people were gaining weight by following the dietary guidelines were that they were eating large amounts of fructose and glucose that was increasing insulin. Um, if insulin is raised, then uh, the satiety hormone leptin uh, is blocked. The brain can't see leptin. And so mm -hmm. his argument was you continue to eat past a time where you would have normally got the satiety signal. 
which was very interesting to me. And that, that was my experience. You eat the wrong things. You put the weight on despite what you exercise or anything else you might try to sort of shed it. It's, it yes. alters your perception of hunger and satiety. The, the, the biomedical feedback is no longer working because you're putting the wrong fuel in the machine. So, yeah, yeah, yeah. that was my yeah. sort of um, biggest attraction and why I actually tried to apply those principles in my own life. Along with, um, you know, YouTube's like you watch a video on a, a topic and, and it happily serves you up a related topics. So were, I started watching these videos and whenever they would um, bring up a paper and make an argument for it, I'd, I'd pause the screen and go looking for the PDF and try and download that and read through the paper. The problem yeah. was I'm not trained in any sort of understanding of the research process. So I wasn't that able to, you know, uh, endorse it or argue against it. But uh, it, it was interesting. Uh, I came across another guy called Dr. Johnny Borden. Uh, he brought out a video called the great cholesterol myth mm. and he, that was an, an interesting one. have you seen that one i haven't actually no no okay no. He, he talks a lot about um the cause of heart disease uh being inflammation and not dietary saturated fat um he talks a little bit about how studying medications work and he's not a great fan of them um no. so he was arguing that you know uh, the cause of heart disease is inflammation from various things, but principally diet. So again, um, filling in the gaps, um, you know, I, I found that I was, you know, getting thinner rather than getting yeah. fatter, which had been yeah. a sort of decade long process. Uh, it's not so bad in your teens, but, you know, 10 years later, it's a different story if you're not putting the right fuel in the machine. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry, John. It was the great cholesterol myth, wasn't it? The Great Cholesterol Myth, right. Dr. Johnny Borden. Um, okay. Yep, still out there. Um, I guess if you're eating a lot of sugar, um, you get a lot of uh, sugar in the bloodstream, which most people probably know is not ideal, and uh, you know, no. diabetics deal with that on a daily basis. But the damage that um, sugar does, it actually chemically binds to proteins, uh, for instance, on the red blood cells and anywhere else it can. And then that... Um, piece of your, your equipment can't function properly because, you know, it's got things bonded to it that are uh, stopping it performing as it should. Um, so again, that process was also driving inflammation, mm -hmm. driving heart disease in, you know, in a number of decades. So um, he also pointed the finger at seed oils, which, mm. are, you know, they've been in, in the diet for probably 150 years. And, um, the major difference between animal fat, saturated fats and seed oils and fruit oils is the amount of unsaturated um, fat in there with double bonds. Um, so mm. there are hydrogens missing. You know, it's not saturated with hydrogens because the carbon has got double bonds. Um, I, I guess he, he also, not him, there was another guy, another video that was really against oils uh, rather than animal fats because they have only been in the human future food chain for about 150 years and ironically that was about as long as the discipline of cardiology has right. been around so uh, again not cause and effect but it was an interesting uh, association in other words yeah. you know heart attacks and things like that didn't really happen except through things like uh, rheumatic fever and damage to the heart valves but yeah. we didn't get coronary heart disease. We didn't get atherosclerosis and strokes generally uh, because we weren't eating a diet that was rich in these um, unnecessary oils. So, you know, yeah. We weren't exposed to them in the, the amounts that we are now. Um, oils, uh, I've, I've spoke with Professor Bart Kay. Um, he'll be featuring in this uh, video, I think, not by himself, but we'll be talking about him. Yeah, um, definitely. <laughs> and he's, you know, he says the seed oils are very pro-inflammatory uh, you know so really adding to the problems with excess carbs and sugar in carbs the diet and sugar. as well yeah yeah not for a sure. great mix so you know um <laughs> just rounding up this this situation uh this section rather um i got really passionate about um you know changing the diet and uh, you know I'd, I'd found out something that not a lot of people in the public knew uh, obviously mm. there were 
credential people that had done the work. Yeah. But, uh, it, everybody thought you've got to have your fruits and veggies, you've got to have a balanced diet. And it seemed from these quite credential people that that wasn't the case. Um, you know, our work environment, Geoff, there's some tragic cases. You know, people started coming in to our ward for rehab post-stroke. And some of these guys were younger than me um, with dense hemiparesis and, you know, the end of their sort of quality of life as they knew it. Um, so, yeah, I was real fired up and I would bore the students to death talking about this stuff. And uh, once or twice, I uh, remember you saying, oh, are we talking about this again? So, <laughs> you know, um, but, you know, it, it's just tragic that uh, a lot of this uh, modern chronic disease is actually avoidable. We don't need to get it in the first place if we fuel the machine properly. So I, I guess yeah. that's the, you know, the, the thing that got me into low carb. Um, yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, it's awesome, John. Cause, uh, you know, I, I, I've told this countless times on my channel, how, um, there was this one colleague that, that would, you know, talk talk students to death or, or or nurses to death about you know dangers of carbs and seed oils and you know i happen to be one of those people in the in that room at the time and yeah it, it was uh it was it was I, w I must admit it was crazy talk at first because um it it really goes against the grains of what we have been taught about no pun intended but yeah about yeah. what we've been taught about human nutrition and um and and I think you know you were sort of the first one who, uh, you know I guess broke those you know that that barrier for me to to actually step into this sort of space of um, diet and nutrition because you're right yeah. we what kind of training do we get as nurses in in um, exactly right. in nutrition I couldn't understand why these you know professors in the field were saying this is this is not good what we what we're eating and the yeah. government departments were saying you eat the standard american diet you know follow the food guidelines and and, and yeah there was a bit of an anomaly there for me to but yeah that sparked my interest yeah so yeah guys for the viewers um john was uh you know the the guy that got me started into this journey so a lot to be thanked thankful about uh, we can talk about you know um you know why you got into the so you've got into the low carb space into the sort of keto carnivore space what has changed for you yeah. in this way of eating i guess the biggest thing i noticed uh, i didn't notice it straight away so i stuck to the guidelines i carried on watching my videos and reading my papers and then about a year after I'd started this, I realized that I'd had absolutely no bouts of depression in the past probably nine months to a year when I got started getting into this way of eating. And, you know, I, I, I wasn't chronically depressed, but, you know, three or four times a year, I'd, I'd get really low and, you know, uh, and that just stopped happening. So I thought, OK, maybe maybe that's uh, one thing that's that's, you know downstream of changing the diet the mm -hmm. other was obviously the um the, the the beer belly the tummy you cut the beers out that's an improvement but you're just cutting out the sugary foods and starchy vegetables particularly um i, I noticed that i did lose some weight although i didn't look like you do joff I, uh, <laughs> that was a step a step too far and i guess um it was only around about 12 months for me maybe a shade less that i and got into the carnivore diet. So I guess um, I what I did notice was I dropped down to about 83 kilograms, which still for me was in the overweight category on the BMI yeah. uh, scale. And I thought, well, I'm, I'm doing the right thing. I'm eating uh, a low carb diet, which is, uh, you know, mm. Mediterranean, whatever you want to call it. Yeah. Um, but it, I still wasn't back when I was like in my early twenties, I was just wasn't built like that anymore. Um, but going carnivore, that was, you know, it's like a step too far at the time. And I thought you know, it's a little bit extreme this diet, but we'll, I guess we'll get into the fact that it isn't extreme a little bit later yeah. on. So, so again, I, I um, dropped nine kilograms without trying, without hunger. Wow. Um, 
in 12 weeks. So, you know, nice steady, wow. slow yeah. decline, and then a plateau at um, 74 kilograms now, which has me right in the gr- middle of the green band for healthy, healthy weight. And I'm 57, you know, so there's a lot of people my age who are yeah. uh, uh, in the in the red zone, so to speak. In the red zones, yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah. Now, I, I better say here that I'm not a perfect carnivore. I, I indulge mm. in coffee. Um, oh, who is? Not... Who's a perfect carnivore? <laughs> Well, yeah, fair enough. Uh, but I haven't yet gone down the uh, line that you did uh, trying to go with that, you know, without it. But, you know, maybe we'll we'll look at trimming it down a little bit. And also, I, I do like the odd glass or two of uh, red wine uh, yeah. on an evening. So, you know, um, for those out, out there who are considering the diet, it's not the end of, of all enjoyable things. You, it's just what you do the majority of the time. If you do the mm. right thing, 80% plus, then you'll you'll reap most of the benefits, I think. Yeah, that's it. Um, yeah. The other thing uh, I did notice is that I started eating uh, once a day. I might have a couple of pieces of steak and some melted mm. butter or, you know, a bit of garlic here and there. Um, so I sort of ended up eating once a day, which I still do now, uh, around about four to six o'clock in an, in, in an evening. You know, people ask me, uh, are you doing intermittent fasting? And I sort of wasn't... Most people that do intermittent fasting uh, uh, have their willpower geared up and they're, they're determined to eat only within a, you know, a short window. But I was finding I was That's doing it. this naturally without uh, any sort of willpower or oh, I can't eat yet, although I'm hungry. I just wasn't. And, I, and it's, it's turned out for me that I eat one meal of meat. Um, I do eat all animal products. I'm not one of these uh, beef, butter, salt and water people. I'm not criticizing them, mm. but it's... Yeah, I, I, I still eat. Yeah, I've got a family and uh, they yeah, don't always yeah. want to eat beef all the time. So you have to sort of respect them as well. So, yeah, um, I guess that's, um, you know, a summary of, of what happened to me when I uh, went fully carnivore. Yeah. Mm. So that step into the carnivore. When I first heard about the carnivore diet and, and I, I immediately thought this is going to be a bit extreme. And so. You know, uh, I'm sure it's it's shared amongst everyone else who sort of jumped into the diet as well. Um, but I guess uh, what was the what convinced you um, about this way of eating, about the carnivore diet? Uh, what 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 I guess what I'm tr- I'm trying to ask is that um, um, compared to low carb and keto, what was the the definitive factor that that you know made you say oh, I think kind of was the way to go. Sure. Well, I guess when you see somebody um, your age and your build at the time, you were you were a, a fairly uh, oh yeah. Weight, I think it's fair to say that so, was a big you know, boy. There were, yes. There were two. There were two main things. Um, I remember being your age and struggling with that. Yeah, you know, I couldn't get the weight off despite yeah. the exercise and anything else. And then you see somebody transform from, I don't know what you were, but you were up around about 100 kg. I was about 100 kilos, 100 kilos yeah. down to 60, yeah. 60 kilos. So, yeah. yeah. I mean, when somebody loses 40 kgs, it, it, you know, especially when they're there to ask, hey, what, how did you do that? <laughs> um, <laughs> and so, so that was probably a major for me. Um, I did speak to at the time. I thought, well, you know, what about your, you know, your, your trace elements and your vitamins yeah. and, and things like that. So I still had a few sort of, you know, I'm not entirely convinced about this, but there's obviously something in it because you looked 10 years younger than you did 10 years ago. It was just, oh, a, thank you. you know, quite a, tra- a transformation. Um, the other thing that you recommended when we, when we talked about this was yeah. um, you said, look up Professor Bart K on the YouTubes and, uh, I did. I mean, this guy is a well-credentialed uh, gentleman. He's got three advanced research degrees, I think, in statistical inference or something like that. Don't don't quote me on that. But um, yeah, right. uh, also, he's uh, in nutrition. And one the one that interested me was the um, one in cardiovascular pathophysiology. pathophysiology. Mm. This is a man who knows what causes heart disease and what doesn't. And mm. uh, I initially, I. I followed all his channels, which were <laughs> entertaining and uh, informative. Uh, he tends to wear two hats, yeah, that is the suit and tie uh, professor, yeah. or, or we've got the wombleery and the, uh, <laughs> yeah. you know. Um, so, yeah, uh, his, his clear message was 
straight out of the literature. Mm. I think it impressed me about him as well is he could look at the nutrition science, which generally is associational, and the findings didn't seem to be that spectacularly um, pointing in one direction or the other. They could always be argued against with other papers, whereas I guess, you know, that could uh, pull up a paper and the paper would claim to do this and Bart will say, well, it doesn't do that because they didn't do this, they didn't do that. Mm. And then at the end, they didn't report what they found. They um, altered their findings. I think I've forgotten what the, the term they use when they do that. Um, oh, they allowed yeah. for age or smoking or something. They essentially, they changed the data that they actually got. Um, oh, that's right, yeah. In, in line with the people who paid for the, uh, you know, the research one would think. Um, so... Yeah, um, I guess Bart also, um, I started um, speaking with Bart over Skype um, and that was fantastic. I, You know, the, the questions, the sort of questions I would ask after seven years looking at uh, this field and the impressive thing was he never had to go away and look anything up. He would just answer straight off the top of his head and I just thought, man, this, you know, this guy knows what he's talking about. So... It, so I was getting more confident that, you know, this diet probably was the, the way to go. Um, he was saying one day that, you know, there is this associational um, research, you know, so it's not cause and effect, but this mm. seems to be traveling along with this. And, and he said to me that, you know, if you go to the Gold Coast on a hot summer's day, you'll find that, um, you know, ice cream sales correlate very well with sun, but cases of sun, sunburn. However, if you close the ice cream sh shops down, it's the sunburn isn't going to go away. They're not connected. Uh, yeah, and he yeah. said that that really is underpinning the food, the nutritional research. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, and of course, he, he, the other thing he was talking about is you can't, lock people in labs and actually do empirical science on them. It, you, you wouldn't get it past ethics. It's not affordable to do. So this is, I think, the reason he was saying that, you know, the vegans think they're right, the carnivores think they're right, and everybody mm. in the Mediterranean middle thinks they're right as well. Um, so, yeah. Um, I guess the, the study that clinched it for me was, I don't know if you've got access to the... Um, stable isotopes oh yeah yeah the no I've got, yeah I've got the that, paper yeah. by uh, hedges and reynard uh, entitled uh, nitrogen isotopes and the trophic level of humans in archaeology um, i'll have that up on the screen the, yeah. okay so what um what bart says uh, about this paper is whenever um human remains were found um you know ancient human remains i should say um, they um, took the collagen from the long bones and they tested it in a lab to see um, whether the heavier or the lighter isotopes of carbon and nitrogen were present. Now, if they were the heavier types, that would indicate the protein they consumed was from animals. And if they were the lighter type, then it would be largely a plant-based diet. And what they found was, uh, regardless of the age of the Homo sapiens sapiens remains, and wherever they were found geographically over the Earth, they all came back as eating principally um, animal protein. So these people hunted and, you know, ate meat, essentially. Mm, yeah. Uh, not vegetables. I guess fruit and vegetables that we recognize today are largely a, a human invention maybe 100, 150 years old. They've been bred and selected for to be bigger and sweeter and more colourful. But they, going back pre-agrarian revolution, eight to 12,000 years ago and before, there wasn't oranges and lemons like there are today. We wouldn't have eaten those unless there was, you know, the hunt had been unsuccessful for yeah, some days. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, so, yeah, I guess once you get into that type of research where it's not it's empirical you you drill down with the numbers and the answer is this it's not associational it's actually testing what you're testing for uh, yeah so yeah that that sort of convinced me that you know for um i guess three hundred and fifty thousand years up until about twelve thousand years ago 
that's the way we lived. Our genes have developed on that diet. And uh, going back to growing grass and rice and other, eating other things are yeah, a really, relatively recent addition to the human diet and not, mm. you know, I guess what we're saying is, you know, it's not a fad diet. It's been around longer than any other diet in terms of yeah. current speciation. Yeah. yeah. Um, and I guess I, I've got this wonderful book here, um, 1949, first edition. Um, oh, yes, yes. The, the Lascaux cave paintings. I don't know if you can see that. Yeah, can see it. Um, this was uh, this cave was discovered fairly recently in in geographical um, geological times, I should say. Um, but the paintings were dated to about seventeen thousand years ago. And hmm. if you look on the cave walls there, uh, I don't know if you have got the pictures handy. I can um, have them on the screen. Yeah, I'm yeah, okay. Right now, yeah. Okay, so um, you know, there's no fruit salad. There's no vegetables up there. No. It's, it's it's all. <laughs> wildebeest, zebra, different types of horses that, you know, slightly different to the ones we have today. Uh, but, you know, essentially they, they were all about uh, animals as, uh, you know, yeah. not, not fruit, fruits and veggies. So I guess that's, <laughs> you know, it was a gradual process, but um, one that, you know, I'm confident of now and seeing the changes in myself and, you know, the mental health, again, clicked up another um Point when when I went fully carnivore, and mm. you do know about it if you wander back and uh, start eating in a uh, yeah sort of you, you get used to feeling very well, and it's only when you go and do something silly like have a you know gorge out on pizza that you just think oh yeah why did I do that you know oh man yeah not that pizzas every now and then aren't a good thing but yeah. they're certainly not day day to day food they're definitely birthdays and things like that yeah no no. I think um, eating, you know, a standard Western diet, we we lose our way of of you know listening to our own intuition and, and how our body works. Um, I think you get used to whatever you do to yourself. If you're hungover every morning, it becomes normal. If you if yeah. you eat pizzas and get good ache every day, it becomes normal. It's it's you know it's just part of the human condition. But if you eat the right things then your body will certainly let you know when you're eating the wrong things. Yeah. So. Yeah. Oh, definitely. And uh, um, I found that out very recently. Uh, I had a cup of coffee a few days ago and that, that didn't bode so well after, gee, nearly three months of uh, wow. having was no coffee. That, is it that long? Wow. It was, it was, yeah. It's been three months. I haven't had a, and had a coffee and I had my first one and, oh God, it was, uh, I won't go into details, but my you body felt it. it. I, I I definitely knew I had it. Yeah. <laughs> um, but yeah. Um, I wanted to go back to, to a couple of you know just to summarize your points a little bit there because, you know, the question was what convinced you to um that, that the kind of all diet is is the correct way of eating for humans. I uh you know I couldn't agree more. Uh the things that solidified it for me or, or that I felt was the things that, that made it clear to me that this is the way of, of eating the, the proper human diet, if you want to call it that way, it was the, the Randall cycle, the Randall mm -hmm. cycle. Um, it was the um, understandings of how nutritional sciences um, work. Yeah. yeah. Uh, yeah. I guess we haven't talked about what the Randall cycle is, basically. No, so, we haven't. No, you know, uh, I, I guess um, that was was again that he, he, I told you it was yeah. going to feature a lot in this, but um, I guess what people call insulin resistance is what that causes calls the Randall cycle. So, yeah. Professor, sorry, he was Professor, but he also got knighted. So, Sir Philip Randall uh, in 1963 um, discovered that. The, the body uses fats and glucose. And mm. if you've got a lot of glucose around, you'll tend to um, use that as fuel and the, you won't be using a lot of fat. Uh, and mm. if you eat a lot of fat, um, conversely, there'll be a bit of a sliding scale um, and you won't be using a lot of glucose. But if you eat 
um, a mix, you know, if you eat proteins, fats and carbohydrates in one meal, it does cause a problem. So what, what will happen is that you'll have a lot of energy in the blood. That energy will um, try and get out of the blood. So the body will try and yeah. divert that into, you know, um, glycogen storage in the liver, um, getting it across into the muscle cells, the glucose. Uh, same with the fats. But if you've got both present, your, your cells fill up with energy and a little bit spared as well for the mitochondria and the cytoplasm. But when they've got enough, they won't take excess nutrition into the cells because that will damage the cell. So right. like that says, the, the cell doors, the CD30 something, I can't remember, where, yeah. which is where the fatty acids come in, fatty acids, the glute yeah. glu four. Uh, that gets switched off from the inside. So insulin can't bind to the GLUT4 receptor and the glucose is stuck in the bloodstream. Mm -hmm. um, when, you, when you've got lots of fat and lots of glucose in the bloodstream, it's it's doing damage to the vascular tree. Hence, we get the, you know, think, uh, heart disease happening uh, and stroke, of course. So the, the liver comes to the rescue like it does whenever you do things mm -hmm. that uh, you shouldn't do. And the glucose, the excess glucose gets packaged up and gets turned into triglycerides and sent to the fat cells. And the insulin helps that get into the fat cells as, as well. Uh, I guess what we haven't covered is if you eat a, a keto or carnivore diet, um, we need proteins, we need fats, but exogenous carbohydrates we don't need to eat glucose we have a mechanism for manufacturing glucose and the good thing about relying on this is you never have the condition where you've got too much glucose in the bloodstream you don't get that glycation because your body makes it on demand and yeah. stops making it when there's sufficient so i just thought we'd, we'd we'd bring that in but if you eat a lot of glucose and a lot of fat you get a lot of inflammation yeah no, that's awesome. Yeah, sorry, I I, I didn't uh, uh I wasn't sure if you mentioned about the Randall cycle. I think the, the word Randall cycle and Bart K go hand in hand together. So yeah, uh, but, yeah, yeah, yeah. But now that's all right. So yeah, the Randall cycle, um, nutritional science and how that's flawed, and the stable isotope data that that's what solidified it for me. The big three that really solidified for me uh, that this is the way humans should be eating. And your um, own anecdotal experience, you know, when you when you put the right food in the machine, you suddenly yeah. see that the you know positive changes. Oh yeah, like I, I mean, the, the, on top of that, yeah, the, the the stuff that I was experiencing um, for me personally was just, you know, uh, it it made it made sense. It it totally made sense. And people, they you know, you buy a forty grand car. And you make sure you put 98 in it or 95 or whatever the you know yeah. manufacturer recommends, and then you fill your own body, which is priceless, with the uh, the wrong fuel. It's uh, a yeah. bit uh, yeah yeah no, that's right. All right, John. So I wanted to get into this a little bit, uh, seeing as we're both registered nurses, um, and how I guess has this this whole journey or this, the, the things that you've learned, how has that impacted your perspective on, on your practice as a nurse and how you view health and nutrition now? Well, I guess a summary of, of what we've said so far is, you know, nutrition equals health, probably more than anything else. I mean, if you rule mm. out, um, you know, drinking a bottle of scotch a day or smoking yeah. cigarettes, but you know, um, I, I think, that's clear that um, yeah, that's where your health comes from. Um, yeah. I think when, I don't know if you remember going back to your nurse training, it was a long time ago for me, but yeah. I remember this, this, these two words that I didn't understand uh, at the time. So I looked them up and one was beneficence and one was uh, non-maleficence. So doing mm. good and doing no harm. And yeah, that was drilled into us. You know, you must do good and you must not do harm. And mm -hmm. then I found myself having to administer substances uh, that, you know, may not be beneficial for people. Um, I'm talking food, I'm talking supplementation, yeah. uh, certain medications, you know, when you mm -hmm. look into the actions and mechanisms of those, you know. Um, 
it's a bit of a worry and it does cause you a little bit of uh am i doing the right thing yeah yeah, yeah. but um i guess looking at the um rise in um type 2 diabetes i think going back at oh, nine or ten years i used to actually count up on the hand over how many type 2 diabetics we had and we oh, went yeah. between 15 and 20 25 percent sometimes obviously it fluctuates depending on who gets admitted yeah but we've just seen that over the the 13 years i've been there yeah and we're up to 40 or 50 percent now so it's it, it's obvious that the you know the um the obesity and type 2 diabetes metabolic disease a lot of other connected diseases that go with yeah. that are increasing um just very sad that it's happening to people younger and younger yeah um, oh yeah i guess knowing yeah. knowing what we do about the randall cycle and you know the signs we've just talked about i look at the uh I'm trying to tiptoe through this uh, because i don't want to be disrespectful to anybody uh the health mm -hmm. professionals we work with but when you look at the the hospital food that's served up you know by, by far the biggest food group is carbohydrate there's a right. dessert with with every meal there's mm. mid meals which are cake or cheese and crackers you know mm. nothing wrong with cheese uh, in my opinion if you can tolerate mm. it yeah but yeah the protein and the fat is all uh quite uh, reduced well certainly the fat is all low fat and yeah. yeah um these people are coming in with you know amputations wounds um joint replacements they're trying to heal their bodies while their blood sugars are 15 16 and that's not going to happen or it's not going to happen quickly because the no. you know high blood glucose is counterproductive to healing and things like that um mm -hmm. i guess i got so passionate about this i, I spoke to a gentleman called paul uh, he was a um consultant neurophysiotherapist uh one of only two in queensland and we were very privileged to have paul working uh, on our ward a very clever guy mm -hmm. Um, I had a chat with him. Uh, I said, you know, maybe we could look at um, providing uh, half of the type, type 2 diabetics that come in, if they're mm. willing, a lower carb diet. Um, and he said, you know, we're going to need a, a consultant, you know, a doctor uh, on board with this project. Uh, I said, no problem. I, I spoke to, <laughs> ironically, one of our doctors who's recently become carnivore. Um, yeah, which uh, but back then obviously she she wasn't, but um she said yeah good idea sounds sounds like uh, mm. we better we better have a dietitian on board so yeah I thought okay in my normal gentle way or not so gentle as it turned out but um, I had a chat with her about the the video uh, Robert Lustig's Sugar the Bitter Truth and obviously it was yeah quite foreign to to her but I never forget what she said when I suggested that we try a lower carb diet for some of them uh, some of the type 2 diabetics and a normal standard diabetic hospital diet for the remainder and we see what happened to their requirement for insulin or the requirement for other uh, diabetic tablet medication because mm. my gut feeling was that if you don't put the amount of glucose in you don't need the amount of insulin to process that you don't need mm -hmm. the amount of other medications because your blood sugars are more under control and the reply was uh, from the dietitian at the time was I couldn't be um, part of something as irresponsible as that and I've never forgot even though I had to look at the uh, thing there to get the wording right I've never forgotten that and I just thought there's a lot still to do if we're going to begin to turn this around because yeah. public health is, is getting you know worse and worse and we just can't afford the amount yeah. of chronic uh, burden of disease that we're we're dealing with um I guess, you know, and I'm really not disrespecting the dietitians here. They, the graduates, they they are taught the sort of associational science, and they do their job to the best of their ability, just like we do. But mm. I, I'm not in agreement that that science and the food guidelines are appropriate diets for human beings. So, mm, yeah, <laughs> you know, um, when patients are malnourished. You may have had a fall, a hip replacement. A lot of our rehab is stroke and orthopedic. Yeah. Uh, falls yeah. and fractures, joint replacements, that kind of thing. People have been, you know, lying in a bed, not, you know, not moving. 
uh, Paul, the neurophysiotherapist, um, had told me that for every day um, a patient lies on the bed, they lose 5% of their muscle mass and 5% the next day, 5% the next day. So obviously it doesn't, you're off your feet for a week, it's impossible to get back on them at the end of the week or you certainly yeah. notice yeah. that. So, so these people had sort of depleted in protein mainly and obviously fat, but mm. we, we supplement um, these patients who are deemed to be malnourished. But when, when I looked at the ingredients um, of the pegs and the NG feeds and the, you know, the supplement build-up drinks, they essentially goes something very similar to this. First ingredient, water. Second ingredient, maltodextrin. Third ingredient, milk solids. Fair enough, protein. Mm. Um, fourth ingredient, seed oils. You know, a mixture of sunflower and um, yeah. rapeseed oil, I think. And, you know, you've had a stroke and you've been invited to recover um, on, on those foodstuffs or food-like substances. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it causes me a little bit of a concern uh, as to whether we're doing the best by our, our patients, I guess. Um, I guess the science that underpins that way of, um, you know, the food guidelines and things that we're given are associational. So, you, you know, you may uh, have two large groups of people, 100,000 in one group and 100,000 in the other. And yeah. one group gets a tablet and the other one gets a placebo, uh, you know, the active ingredient, the placebo. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, you know the, the results come out and you, you have a 24% reduction um, if you take the active ingredient compared with those in the, and that sounds, you know, you start doing the math, don't you? That's, that's, you know, four, uh, one out of four, one out of five. Yeah. Uh, depending yeah. on which way you look at the 24%, which is it? whether it's added or, yeah. Um, but when you look at it, you, you know, this isn't the um, actual numbers, but so in a, in a hundred thousand people in, in one group, there were a 124 incidents and in the other group, there were a hundred and yeah, that's a 24% difference from one group to the other, but it's yeah. 24 cases out of a hundred or 200,000 people. Yeah. Not, yeah. So that 24% is not over the hundred thousand. It's just no. the different percentage uh, of the, you know, incidents in one group, not the other. Um, yeah. And yeah. that's the type of science that we are following. Mm -hmm. um, the food guidelines are based on. Uh, which, again, I wondered why, when this information is available, why we, we don't do something. I guess we, we know the reason then. It usually yeah. turns out to be the uh, the money, the profits for the food and the drug that's industry. That's it. That's it. Yeah, um, there you are. I've said it. Um, but um, if you look at uh, you know, other associational uh, science, so-called, um, still not cause and effect, you know, smoking versus non-smoking. When you do that same... Um, group, uh, same sort of numbers of people, but you look at smokers and non-smokers, you find an 11,000% decrease or increase if you're a smoker. Yeah. Um, now, that's like Bart says, it's still not cause and effect, but it would be enough to um, convince me to stop smoking. To stop if smoking, My yeah. risks were 11,000% uh, more as a smoker. Yeah. Whereas, you know, the 24% the that the um, statin manufacturers claim is a relatively, you know, I wouldn't be wanting to potentially take a medication, not not talking about statins, but just any medication, if there were only that small benefit and mm -hmm. unknown possible side effects, which, you know, I think have been argued um, by people that, you know, statins can reduce your risk of a secondary heart attack or stroke. Um, right. But they don't do it by lowering cholesterol. That's not um, the methodology. They actually are an anti-inflammatory. Yeah, and that's right. Yeah. If, if heart disease causes inflammation, if you can lower that uh, inflammation, then you're, you know, you're going to have fewer events in, in those sort of numbers of people. I guess the... <laughs> The thing that I found out is that you can't work out a bad diet. If you eat a bad diet, then 
yeah, you, you've got to stop eating that bad diet if you want things to improve. Um, medications, I've found that, you know, they have limited effects because they don't address the root cause. No. You know, if you stop eating a bad diet and start eating a good one, then you're changing the very thing that cause, that's causing the problem. Whereas a lot of medications, in my personal opinion, they do, they're band-aids. And, you know, I think doctors follow, um, you know, their protocols, don't they? And if somebody presents yeah. with high cholesterol, they get prescribed A, B, and C. Yeah, um, yeah. I don't think we, we put enough emphasis on informing our patients, regardless of which um, discipline it is, it, looking at actually reversing what's caused their problems rather than right. just, you know. But again, it's just my, an observation of the, the whole healthcare model. Um, yeah, yeah. I, I think we could do better. I guess if you look at the um, information for our patients, you know, so the various publications around the ward, um, mm. I, I've got a couple here. Um, I'll just look at quickly, and, and I'm not sing, singling these out particularly. One is, um, and I guess you'll put, put these up on the screen. Yeah, I'll have it um, on the screen. Diet after stroke. Um, and it, there's, it's very good in, in how it says, you know, you might have these problems post-stroke, you know, swallowing, mobility, depression yeah. and yeah yeah um that's good and then it says guidelines for healthy eating and we've got things like eat plenty of fruits and vegetables um lots of fruit grains mostly whole grain high fiber i guess the, the, the viewers can see this up on the on the screen yeah lean meats poultry fish eggs tofu nuts seeds legumes and beans um Milk, yogurt, cheese, and their alternatives, mostly reduced fat. Um, again, it, it, it sort of sounds like the dietary guidelines rather than the science that we've come to sort of understand and enjoy. Yeah, yeah. yeah. There's another one here on, on um, nutrition and wound healing. Again, uh, it, it, it's pretty much the same advice. Eat your breads and fruits and vegetables. Um then on the back, interestingly enough, it says, uh, this is a guide only and does not replace clinical judgment. <laughs> nice little disclaimer on the back. Yeah. But, you know, this is uh, this typifies that kind of material that we give to patients. So, we, you know, it's down, to, it's down to you and me, Geoff, to sort of give them the, you know, cause and effect, the root cause solutions to yeah, a lot yeah. of their problems. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and, and I find that to be, you know, Again, I've mentioned this a few in a few videos, but that is a challenge that, um, unfortunately, as a healthcare worker, uh, we're going to have to uh, push through with that for uh, you know a few few more decades or even longer, you know. And that's that that's not thinking you know um, negatively or, or being a, a downer about the situation, but it is the, the truth. I mean. Um, we saw the recent clip on on sixty minutes uh, with Dr. Oh, Anthony Chafee. Yeah, 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 and and how that was received. Uh, and yeah. I was speaking to a uh, another uh, to someone else about this. Um, uh, Dave from uh, Zero Carb. He he was saying, you know, twenty years ago they did the same thing with the Atkins diet. On I think it was a current affair. It had a segment. Yeah. Um, not perfect, and, but it's... yeah and nothing's changed nothing's changed it's the yeah. same yeah and so uh you know yeah you're right it's it's uh up to the likes of um yourself and and you know me as well to yeah. you know somehow get the message across to, to I've, people i've had a couple of successes uh I, you know yeah occasionally we get the same people uh, yeah. coming back in uh, after yeah, another yeah. fall or, or whatever yeah, and I think there were two people who had managed to change their diet enough to get off insulin. And you know, yeah. when I when I look at my campaign of probably um, seven or eight years, uh, mm. two two people that I know about, it's not it's not a big hit, but you know, for them, they've they've slowed down at least their. Um, diabetes hopefully you know yeah uh, yeah but if you've gone from requiring insulin to not requiring insulin then you know that's a big step 
And uh, yeah, you yeah. Know, I was really chuffed to hear, even though it was only two people. It's it's a start, isn't it? You know, it, it is but, a start. Yeah. yeah, yeah. I just keep putting the message out there and pointing people to the science. I, you know, because That's I'm it. not qualified. I'm a, I'm a qualified nurse. I'm not qualified to offer. Um, guidance myself, but I yeah. will point them to the videos. I'll point them to the science, and then they can, you know, make their own uh, more informed choices. I think. Yeah, the other people I think we've we've made quite a, you know, or I've noticed myself that um, I've impacted is uh, obviously the people around us and and colleagues at work uh, who've True. actually, yep. yeah, as you say, a bit, a bit of traction there. A um, hmm. few colleagues that are, are you know have. Um, we've sparked that interest and then some who've actually started on the carnivore diet, which is, which is great. Um, yeah. But yeah, um, it's, um, it, yes. If you've got, if you want to lose weight, most people, you know, want to do it without too much effort. They want, they yeah. want some magic and, and, you know, they, they want to lose their weight. They still want to eat what they want. You, you give them a way that uh, doesn't require willpower. Uh, you know, yeah. if, you, if you stop eating anything except the, um, muscle meat of large ruminant animals and its associated fat, you will not be able to hang on to the, uh, in most people, the level of body fat that you currently have. It's just, you won't be able yeah. to keep it even if you wanted to. Yeah. So. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, John. Well, uh, I guess to summarize everything and to wrap things up, tell us uh, uh, where, do you have, you have social media? You've got social media. Oh, I do. I'm I'm a bit of a, a dinosaur when it comes down to uh, social media. I'm I'm alright on YouTube, but I yeah. do have a little YouTube channel. Um, it, it's not uh, it, it's not carnivore related. It's just a little motorcycle channel. Um, I guess you'll stick it up on the uh, on the uh, screen here. It's called yep. Sergeant Magi. Um, don't ask me how I came up with that name for the channel, but uh, that that's it. Uh, so yeah, a bit of motorbikes, a bit of drone flying, a bit of mountain climbing. It's only a very small channel, but uh, you'd be welcome to come across and have a look and uh, definitely leave a comment. Yep, awesome. And don't forget to subscribe to John's channel. And, and I guess uh, just a final uh, comment yeah. from me. Um, my grandparents, uh, they were born in 1938. They lived 80 years. Every yeah. bit of that time was in peak health. Uh, Granddad was still climbing mountains at 79. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You know, he had a heart attack and died at 81 um, after reading the lesson in church. Um, yeah. He smoked a pipe all his life. Yeah. Um, but what we're seeing, you know, in, in in our wards are people who live a similar, might live, you know, 70 years, but the last 20 of those are lived without a leg or, mm. you know, with, with uh, they're unable to enjoy life like they used to before they're, Debilitation, and and that's the sad thing. The only person that's going to help you is you. That's right. Um, yeah. Unfortunately, you know, um, and you have to take responsibility and and do something to prevent that happening to you in the current, you know, uh, standard American diet, fast food. Yeah. That, yeah. That, yeah. If we're not too careful, we we go down that rabbit hole, and yeah, that's the result. That's it. That's it. Um. So yeah. Uh. Thank you for your time, John. We really appreciate Pleasure. it. Thank you. All Thank right. you for having um, me on the channel. Oh, definitely. Uh, I'm sure this won't be uh, the last time. <laughs>